Hello everybody, welcome to our latest edition of K-Hub, Driving Trade Excellence, an initiative of India Business and Trade. K-Hub is a discussion series that's set to redefine the way we perceive and navigate the intricate landscape of business and trade. In this dynamic series, we bring to you face-to-face -face with industry trailblazers and thought leaders who are shaping the future of trade. It's not just a conversation, it's a symphony of ideas, convergence of expertise, and our primary aim is to dissect dominant trends, tackle challenges, and illuminate the path to opportunities across some of the key sectors which uh, are critical to India's future. So today uh, in our Trade Hub series, we have with us Dr. Ram Singh, who is Professor and Head of Trade Discipline at Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. With an extensive teaching experience spanning over 26 years, he build, brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to his role. He has also made a significant contribution in the field of export, import, and trade logistics by authoring three textbooks. His commitment to advancing the understanding of these critical subjects is evident in his written work. Furthermore, Dr. Ram Singh plays a pivotal role in shaping the future of Indian trade through his involvement in training Indian trade service professionals and other officials of Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Beyond academia, Dr. Ram Singh is an accomplished corporate trainer specializing in import-export procedures, trade logistics, international business matters. His practical insights and industry knowledge make him a sought-after uh, thought leader in these uh, domains. In interestingly, he's also a poet at heart, and he has also authored many research and newspaper articles that have been featured in esteemed publications such as Hindu Business Line, Market Express, Policy Circle, Sunday Guardian, and The Wire. Now, today uh, we are going to talk about a particular uh, paper which uh, Dr. Ram Singh has co-authored, and uh, this paper is on the ethanol production ecosystem in India and the policy drivers which uh, you know would help uh, build this ecosystem in the coming uh, years. And we are going to ask him regarding his research and what he has concluded in this on this very critical topic. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ram Singh. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, sir, on uh, this AHA platform. I appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, morning, sir. And uh, to start with, I would uh, request you to please share with our viewers your perspective on India's current energy mix how do you see the importance of sustainability and what options does India have to drive the sustainability in its energy? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning to our viewers and uh, thank you to TPCI for inviting me for this um, discussion on a very important subject, which is important from policy point of view and also operationally. Uh, coming to your question, sir, uh, what is India's current uh, energy mix and how and what kind of energy mix can be sustainable? Let us first delve deep into what is India's current energy mix. So it can be viewed from two perspectives. Sir. First is the installed capacity. What is the installed capacity of various sources of energy that we have in India? And sec second is a cross-generation capacity. Why these two? Because uh, we know that there are certain sources of energy which may have a higher installed capacity, but may have a lower effectiveness. Let me take it with an example. Solar, for example, in, in India's energy mix has a 16% share per se installed capacity is concerned, but it's gross generation capacity just six and a half percent. Regions are very simple because during certain years, certain months uh, in a year, we are not able to tap solar energy so effectively as during the uh, times of summer. So considering that perspective is important to understand from, from both perspectives. So India's installed capacity primarily constitute coal and lignite around 51%, gas 6%, nuclear 2%, hydro 12%, wind 10%, biomass 3%, and solar energy 16%, as, as already I have uh, referred to. Uh, but sir, when we look at it in terms of effectiveness, that how it contributes to gross generation capacity, the primary source of uh, energy in India still come from thermal, which is from coal and lignite. 
around 72 to 73 percent is still coming up and interestingly this share is going up considering our development requirement although we cannot call it sustainable um, so, uh, as, 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 uh, from sustainability uh, perspective but still it is growing and i will cite those regions subsequently gas constitutes only 1.53 percent and then most prominently comes nuclear energy hydro solar which contribute respectively 9%, 6%, and 4%. In recent years, India has given a thrust on other renewables, which constitute biomass and uh, the other emerging energy, including ethanol, to which we are going to discuss too. From sustainability point of view, first, we have to see this term sustainability from lens of India's development perspective. When we say sustainable, so for, for us, since uh, these next two decades are very prime for us in terms of our economic growth uh, to, to what our prime minister call it as amrit kal till 2047 we have given th more thrust to thermal energy although it is not sustainable if we, if we see its carbon footprint fossil fuel is not a, a fuel of future but since our energy requirements are growing very fast so we are our policy makers find it most effective with limited investment to be most effective uh, um, source of energy uh, in our energy mix in the days to come. But having said so, let us not forget that uh, India is a country which, has, which is committed to uh, carbon neutrality and we have already uh, given a target of year 2070 as a uh, becoming a country which, is, which will be zero neutral, <coughs> which will be carbon neutral country concentric those perspectives our policy makers are giving thrust to various other alternatives and ethanol is one of them biomass uh, recently global uh, uh, biomass alliance we have, we have already uh, during g20 we have come up and uh, in addition to that uh, nuclear energy we are coming up in big way um, solar we are coming in big way wind energy we are coming big way but i will speak more about ethanol production ecosystem because that is what we are going to discuss today and it is sustainable sustainable in the sense that um, India's uh, ethanol policy, if you read it very carefully, it gives a thrust on surplus agriculture production to be utilized. So it works bo works both ways, economically as well as socially. I mean, we can utilize our excess agriculture production for tapping it, <coughs> tapping it effectively for our economic needs, but and simultaneously achieve the objective means of um, improving the farm income, reducing our uh, you know, import bill and all those associated issues for which I will subsequent, speak subsequently. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, overall perspective. Uh, secondly, I would like to understand your uh, focus area, the inspiration behind the study on ethanol production ecosystem in India. Uh, basically, an overview of the study which you conducted. What drove you to you know, um, undertake this study? Thank you. Uh, sir, there are three major focus drivers for this study when I was pursuing uh, this particular endeavor. Uh, three critical uh, aspects comes to my mind and these are first is economic, second is ecological and third is social. Let me discuss each one of them one by one. Economically, sir, ethanol production contributes significantly in reducing the import bill of petroleum products. According to our petroleum uh, minister, uh, Hardi Puri uh, ji, uh, India has already saved thousands of crores of rupee uh, with a reduced import bill because we started a, pr a program first E10, uh, which we have successfully achieved in year 2022. Subsequently, realizing the success, government of India has decided to move towards E20. And at that point of time, when this debate was going on, uh, to uh, redefine, uh, redraft our policy and to you know, uh, bring our targets back from 2030 to 2025-26, uh, it's all marketing year, uh, to in enhance the limits to 20% of mandatory blending. I, we thought of, you know, uh, of, of uh, I'm going for a study which can help us understand the nuances involved from different perspectives. So economic perspective was one perspective for which we have discussed that it leads to reduce import bill, reduce uh, sort of outglow of foreign exchange from our country. And, and these are in, important aspects for a developing kind, country like India, which is still which is still having a what we call trade deficit or current account deficit years on year. So foreign exchange is an important subject that we need to factor in. Second and most importantly is a ecologically. Ecologically, it is proven fact from the various studies that 
ethanol is a better fuel than fossil fuel. Its carbon fo footprints are far lower than that of fossil fuel. So if, if we use some surplus agriculture production for our uh, of, um, um, for our ethanol production it, and, it, and simultaneously achieve the objectives of our reducing our carbon footprint as a, as a developing economy. That is something very great. And lastly, and most importantly, ethanol leads to socio-economic well-being of our farmers. So let me illustrate it with, with an example. When we say it improves farmers' income, uh, let, let me take an example. Our, in a, in, for instance, in our country, sugar producers were stressed and they were not getting the remunerative prices, uh, number one. Number two, they are not getting the payment of their sugar cane produced on time because the sugar mills were stressed. Why? Because they do not have a demand. So there was a sugar, sugar glut in the international market. If you see the period 2016-2022, there was a huge glut of sugar supply in the Indian market because there was more uh, 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 supply, less demand, so prices were not, not remunerative. And we have seen years on years, government was giving some subsidy to sugar exports, uh, maybe sometimes 5 to 10 percent, so as to make it competitive in the Indian market. So it is something, money being wasted, rather than pursuing such a major, our policy makers were of opinion, why not to leverage sugar cane for ethanol production. So it will help us achieve those two economic objectives, economic and ecological objectives, and simultaneously improve the farm income. And uh, since a major part of sugar production from India is moved towards ethanol, uh, we have seen that uh, in year 2023, um, because of El Nino effects and other regions, uh, there is a number one less production, more ethanol production. Uh, there is a remunerative price for farmers. And recently we have seen that uh, government is of opinion that there may be a, a problem of sugar in our country. And accordingly, they have put certain restrictions on export of sugar also. So if lo fundamentally looking from farmers' point of view, it is a very good method because it can improve farm income significantly, a, a sector which is highly stressed in India's economy, sir. Right, right. I understand that you're talking about uh, a triple, uh, you know, goal which we can achieve, economic, logical and social. So uh, during your study, uh, what did you find out about uh, other nations which are having a similar objective like US, Brazil, Indonesia of building an ethanol ecosystem. Uh, what are those lessons which uh, they are, have uh, their case studies present us? Uh, sir, let me explain the success story of each country one by one. If we look at the United States of America, uh, they largely bank upon surplus production of maize and soybean, and they have fostered a very robust uh, what we call a robust and sustainable ecosystem for maximizing the socio-economic gains for their farmer. Similarly, Brazil, uh, ethanol production ecosystems largely come from three crops, which is sugarcane, soybean, and maize. Brazil, in fact, has emerged as a success story in sustainable ethanol production. Uh, similarly, in Indonesia, we see Indonesia started very late, but they have come a long way with mandatory 40% blending of petroleum products. Uh, in Indonesia is utilizing vast production of palm oil and has pursued an aggressive policy of biofuel considering high energy prices and their burgeoning import bill. So factoring all this, India's challenges are different from uh, these countries because these three countries have something uh, which is very rich in per se the ethanol, uh, um, recovery of ethanol is concerned. These are soybean, meat, uh, palm oil, and similarly, sugarcane, a huge and surplus production of sugarcane in Brazil, which is not in case of India. India's story is a little different, and we have to accordingly devise a policy considering our domestic requirement. India has 1.4 billion people. Food security is an important issue. Malnutrition is still an important subject in our country. So when we are giving a thrust only to those crops, which are number one, cash crops, and uh, where there is agriculture waste or there is agriculture surplus or agriculture waste. This, this is the whole thrust of India's ethanol production ecosystem. And considering that, government of India is giving trust to crops such as sugarcane. And of late, we have decided to switch over towards maize and, uh, and for the agriculture waste. Agriculture waste, when we can say, for example, broken rice, for which we do not get a remunerative price in the interest market or the or sometime we we 
uh, usually read in the newspaper that there is a stock holding of wheat or stock holding of rice or maybe other crops which is getting wasted because there is no buyer. So such a surplus agriculture production, which is getting as a waste, leading nothing to uh, India's government of India economic kitty, can be effectively utilized for sustainable uh, ethanol production, and which will help us achieve those objectives which we have, we have just discussed. So since ethanol is a cheaper fuel, it it costs just sixty five rupee or maybe seventy rupee per liter of ethanol, and uh, considering ninety five price ninety rupee ninety five or hundred of a petroleum product, ethanol is a better substitute. So, realizing all these objectives, number one, we must foster an ecosystem, sustainable ecosystem, and identify the crops. And, and uh, honorable sir, here I would like to uh, highlight one new crop which is coming up, uh, which is known as uh, again a mage, where the whole stem will give almost 16% uh, uh, ethanol. This is a crop for which the trials are already going up. And I was recently in, in uh, uh, district Pilibit of uh, Uttar Pradesh, where I, I have seen such one, one uh, agriculture field where such crops are being tested by, uh, by our uh, research scientists. And if that comes in, it will completely transform the whole ecosystem of ethanol production ecosystem in our country, sir. Excellent, sir. Those are very, very useful insights indeed. So, uh, so coming to the study, can you, uh, you know, enlighten us on the approach of methodology which you followed uh, on analyzing the correct policy approaches India should adopt and what have been your findings, the critical findings of the study? Hanji, sir. So, per se, this uh, approach for this methodology is concerned. It is based on a, what we call a tested model called Demetel which is basically uh, which enables a uh, policymaker to identify the most appropriate enablers in a policy framework so a policy may be affected by a variety of variables so there, we identified 10 variables after having discussions with experts industry experts uh, that what can be enabler for uh, for a strong or robust or sustainable ethanol production ecosystem in our country. And uh, we, uh, based on those, we rank those, and uh, I will discuss them subsequently, but largely when we discuss findings, uh, we can see that uh, uh, India can uh, capitalize on excess agriculture production for long-term sustainable energy security. Uh, long-term security and energy security. And, and when we say energy security, for me, one thing is very important, energy justice. Because ours is a country uh, where aspirations are high. Uh, we envisage big on uh, our development and uh, accordingly our, our energy consumption requirements are constantly increasing. So we have to tap all possible sources of, of you say, uh, of energy. So considering that if surplus agriculture production can contribute, it will help achieve those three objectives which I discussed, which are e economic, ecological and socio-economic well-being of a farmer. And in terms, uh, in terms of you say uh, other benefits, associated benefits, it will lead to agriculture growth, enhanced economic activity of our nation. Secondly, it provides a great opportunity for our farm to increase their farm income. And thirdly, we can say we can reduce our import bills and and resultantly the outflow of foreign exchange from our country. And let us not forget when is, is such an ecosystem is fostered, which will lead to local business participation and local business development and accelerate the overall economic development. And uh, while achieving these objectives, most importantly, it will lower down the carbon footprint, uh, which are vital for sustainable economic development of any country in the today's policy framework. Sir. Excellent. Excellent, sir. So, uh, what, what do you think uh, should be the future direction of policy research in this regard or uh, research in this sector? What what are the critical interventions the sector needs in the coming years for India? Uh, I, here, I would like to say that we are still a beginner. Uh, we can learn from success stories of uh, a country like Brazil. Rather, we can have a technology sharing agreement with them. But simultaneously, since India's requirements are unique and different from those countries, uh, I already have discussed, we do not have a surplus production of edible uh, crops as United States of America or Indonesia or Brazil have, uh, which is soya bean, um, palm, or maybe uh, other cash crops like maize, 
which are important even for our uh, food energy uh, uh, food security so uh, considering those limitations let us first develop a ecosystem in our country which can be in terms of identifying the all involved stakeholders and all in, in, involved points in the whole value chain uh, for example uh, creating a enabling ecosystem of ethanol compatible vehicles uh, we have recently seen that our government has given a thrust on that and if there is a ethanol compatible vehicle which can run on completely on ethanol and we have seen recently there is a car by toyota which can completely run on ethanol fuel and other cars can effectively use uh, uh, can run on a, a car with with blend, in, in case of blending so it it fosters the ecosystem and most importantly uh, the, there should be a policy support in terms of what we call as a mandatory blending uh, if we learn from success story of indonesia indonesia started from 10% then subsequently increased to 20% uh, and in 2022 uh, when this russia ukraine war started there was a you said a, a spikes in energy prices they have gone to 30% and recently i have read that they are moving towards 40%. So imagine the future that a biofuel can have in an economy like Indonesia. We cannot envisage so big because uh, we will have to factor in the wisdom of, of, of our other uh, our policymakers in a, for other areas. For example, food security is an important subject for our country. But still, we can uh, utilize the surplus production. Uh, the biomass, the biomass is the area which I, I forget to discuss. For example, uh, in during November and December in Delhi, we do have a problem of, of, of a lot of uh, pollution, which is usually coming from a rice producing states of Punjab and Haryana, uh, usually called as Parali. Parali can be a very good source of uh, what we call as natural gases. And uh, if we foster say, enabling ecosystems in, in rice producing states, hopefully um, to, to, to the wisdom of experts, if I bank upon, they say that India can be, become self-sufficient. Although we have envisaged that by 2030, we will have 15% energy mix coming from natural gas. And accordingly, we are signing up plenty of, uh, plenty of agreements with international partners like Oman, uh, uh, Guana, and other countries. But let us not forget, we do have enabling ecosystem with, within our country, which can be biomass uh, uh, in terms of parali and the fodder which is coming from even from wheat, which can be effectively utilized uh, for uh, fostering an ecosystem for ethanol production uh, or, or gases, uh, which can be important part of India's energy mix. Similarly, I would like to highlight that there, need, there is a need for enhanced R&D. We still lacks in that and uh, enhanced facilitation. And most importantly, government should stand by this sector because uh, although we should identify what maximum we can go because there are there, there, there need to be a balance in our country so what maximum support government can offer considering all other requirements factoring all other environment and accordingly we can devise a physical incentives for capacity augmentation uh, in the desired sector which can be in in bio waste in bio what we call uh, 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 bioproducts and also the bioproducts which can be in, in case of sugarcane and new products which are coming up for which I already have discussed like maize a crop which will contribute which which have stem has 16 percent ethanol and which will which, which which will be the future of what we call as of ethanol in in in, in our country so considering all these aspects i think that we are on the right path but uh, we need to factor in uh, uh, enhanced limit of mandatory blending and ethanol compatible vehicle to foster ecosystem for uh, uh, for you say ethanol production ecosystem in India. So, right, sir. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, this was uh, all the questions I had. I think uh, this interaction brought in a wealth of insights into this ecosystem and also the larger issue of sustainability, which uh, we are focusing on at present. And uh, you rightly pointed about how uh, this can achieve, uh, ethanol can help India achieve economic, ecological, and social objectives. At the same time, we need to look at our constraints in terms of what, how much we can develop and how much we can support through this method. And obviously, you know, uh, sustainability has a multi-pronged approach. There are so many ways in which we can do it. We need to just optimize and uh, try to look at every way possible to achieve these three objectives that you have talked about. 
so thank you so much sir for your perspective it's been a pleasure having you and uh, we look it. forward to uh, inviting you for future sessions as well to discuss your invaluable insights on uh, the evolving business and trade ecosystem in india thank you very much sir i appreciate appreciate joining you sir thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank you